A century ago, Cecil Rhodes's pioneer column marched north into the cool and fertile valleys of Mashonaland. The colony that bore his name was founded on a wholesale land grab by British settlers. It went on for more than 50 years. And the independent nation of Zimbabwe is still wrestling with its consequences. Like millions of other Zimbabweans, Ephraim Yakajura and his family just scratch a living on an overcrowded plateau. The soil is thin and sandy here, but Ephraim remembers the valley where he grew up. Rich land, well watered with space to spare, and the day in 1944 when British soldiers came to take it. <laughs> I was very, very unhappy. In my heart, I felt it was the end of the world. I was born on that land, and where I was sent, I felt like a slave or a foreigner from another country. We didn't even know where we were going. So that's how we felt. We really suffered. It's harvest time at Surui Source Farm on the rich black soil of Norton, west of Harare. Tobacco is the farm's most important cash crop and Zimbabwe's biggest export earner. It pays the wages of 75 permanent farm workers and their families and provides a handsome living for Jim Sinclair and his two sons. A little spray for that? Yeah. That's, that's, that's Frogger. That's Frogger. Frogger. Frogger spot. So we've got to do something about that. Eh? Between them, Jim and the boys own two farms and lease a third. Yeah. Okay, Doug. Well, we'll see you. Huh? Okay. You come okay. back for lunch? Yeah, I'll see you later. Bye. They're good farmers and they're proud of it. We're probably spending, in terms of uh, turnover, we're probably pumping. $8 million into the Zimbabwean economy every year and in terms of fertilizer, chemicals, capital equipment, uh, that sort of thing. As well as tobacco, there are maize and hay crops and a thousand head of cattle fattening in Surui Source's lush pastures. It's a good life, but Jim Sinclair feels that he and his family have earned it. His father-in-law bought the land from another white settler in 1933. OK, Jonathan, I thought you might be interested in a couple of things we've got in here. When his wife's father died, Jim paid top dollar to buy out her brothers and sisters. Our wedding in this garden in 1965. They've raised three children and three grandchildren here so far. Uh, my mother and all her children and grandchildren. Wow, yeah. yeah. extended family. Isn't yeah. it? Wonderful. When independence came, Jim was elected president of the Commercial Farmers Union. So that's uh, your friend, the president? Yeah, he was Prime Minister then, we were quite friendly, he was accessible and of course led the policy of conciliation, reconciliation after the war. But unfortunately today uh, he now sends out letters like this. The letter came at the end of November. It gives notice that Surui Source Farm has been designated for compulsory acquisition by the government. Robert Mugabe is no longer Prime Minister. He's the all-powerful president of what is in fact, if not in name, a one-party state. The decision to acquire one-third of Zimbabwe's most productive farms was made without consultation with the farmers or with the international donors who the president expects to pay for it. According to Zimbabwean law, the farmers are entitled to full compensation. But even Robert Mugabe admits that without foreign aid, the money to buy the land just isn't there. If necessary, he said, he'll take it anyway, and the British can pay the bills. We couldn't accept perpetual occupation of most of our fertile land by others and not by ourselves. That 
we objected to. And the British should know that. This is Zimbabwe. It cannot be an extension of Britain. The implication that the white farmers are not Zimbabweans, but others, goes down well with the ruling party elite. It's not so welcome to Jim Sinclair. Well, I don't know what he means by others. If he, if he means I'm others, then I'd be interested to know what I am. I'm a Zimbabwean born and bred. I was born here, lived here all my life, made a commitment to this country. How can you actually say to somebody, I'm going to buy your farm by law, the law says I've got to pay you for it, but I haven't got any money, so actually I'm not going to pay you for it. Now, have we got a, a government that's above its own law? Well, you know, constitutions can be amended any time by parliament. The law can be changed any time by parliamentarians. The principle of acquiring land is the overriding principle. We want to follow the law, but whose law is it? It is ours. Well, some white farmers have said that if you do take the land without compensation, that amounts to just state-sanctioned robbery. Well, that's exactly what they did themselves. When they do it, the question of human rights is not raised. When we do it, the question of human rights is raised. Bordering Jim Sinclair's land at Norton is the communal area of Mondoro home to around 70,000 people and half as many cows. Before the white men came, there were perhaps one million people in what is now Zimbabwe. Now there are 12 million, and the numbers keep growing. Tendai Masiwa has seven cows of his own and four children. He's one of 12 children himself. His father, Langton, was allocated his fields 40 years ago. Now they've been subdivided between his six sons. After decades of use, Tendai's little maize field is not much more fertile than a sand pit. By this time of year on good soil, the corn stalks would be standing taller than a man. Since uh, my grandfather, they started using this soil. Otherwise, it's 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And ca can't you move somewhere else to find... There's nothing I can go. There's grandmother's field, and this one is my mother's field. So uh, there's nothing I can go. It's only this area. As far as Tendai is concerned, the answer is simple. The government should let him move his family onto the white-owned farms next door. In fact, he's fully expecting to do just that before the next planting season starts in August. After all, as his father Langton says, land was what the War of Independence was all about. All riches come from the soil. They wanted soil. That was the first question. And they still want soil? They still want it. And they still haven't got it? They still haven't got it okay. since independence. So if there are all kinds of problems and delays and you don't get that land by August, what do you think people here are going to do? If it is that, otherwise we can organize We young generation and go to those uh, farmers and starting squattering there. Like most Chona peasants, Tendai Masiwa is a loyal member of Robert Mugabe's ZANU-PF party. Such a public threat must have had the party's tacit approval. And certainly, it strengthens the government's hand. Either the government does it, or else the peasants will do it. And when they do it on their own, Having taken the law into their hands, anything could happen. It could create a lot of violence. I mean, surely they're right when they say that it is not politically acceptable to continue to have 4,500 mostly white commercial farmers owning more than 50% of Zimbabwe when you've got 9 million or 12 million well, on the poverty to line. To start with, yes, sure, there's injustice. I don't deny that. There's also, and that's why I support the need for a properly structured, organized, funded land resettlement and reform program, agrarian reform. Nobody's opposed to that. It's in the interest of the country. The problem, as Jim Sinclair sees it, is that the current program 
is anything but structured, organised and funded. You see, the problem that we have is that this government's treating this issue as a political issue. It's not a political issue. We're talking about economics, exports, feeding people, employing people, and this figure is a good example. Because he owns the land, Sinclair has been able to borrow funds to finance improvements like his piggery. But the peasants won't have private title, so the banks won't lend them money. The World Bank, the IMF and major donors like the European Union are just as concerned as Jim Sinclair. They're worried that the crash redistribution scheme will lead to a dramatic decline in food production and the loss of vital export income. Well, unfortunately, we have a country to run and we have to run it. If we are faced with a problem, we are not going to sit and not solve the problem just because the international community may not understand us. There's another group of people who don't understand. The 120,000 people who are employed on the threatened farms. The displaced Chona were reluctant to work on their own land for the white man's wages. So most of Zimbabwe's farm labourers came from Malawi and Mozambique 30 or 40 years ago. They're far from well paid, but Jim Sinclair's workers have a house, a maize plot, a living wage, and nowhere else to go. Now these days, even young, well-educated Zimbabweans like Gift, the foreman of the piggery, have been forced to leave the towns and find work on the commercial farms. Has anybody come and told you what's going to happen to you? No. No, so far. The government is just silent so far. So, if this goes ahead, you lose your house. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I'm going to. You, you lose your income. Yes. What would happen to you if you went to Harare? Well, I'm going to struggle then. That's what it means. If the farm workers are forced to join the job queues, life in the bleak suburbs of Harare will get even tougher than it already is. More than half Zimbabwe citizens have no work. And with interest rates at 35%, there are few investors rushing to create new ones. Inflation is over 20%. The Zimbabwe dollar has crashed and living standards have plummeted. It's in the cities and not on the land that the real time bombs are ticking. There's already been one explosion. For three days in January, Rioters stormed through Harare and its suburbs, looting and burning. The police lost control of the streets and shopping malls. The riots were set off by huge tax hikes and a jump in the price of basic staples like maize meal and cooking oil. In the streets, they pinned the blame squarely on a corrupt and incompetent government. For the first time since independence, Robert Mugabe was forced to send the army into his own Shona heartland. But he hasn't accepted the blame for the price rises. Instead, his government has tried to play the race card again. We have four big millers in this country. They increase their prices one day with the same percentage. And as you know, our, our economy is owned about 95% by the white community in this country or by foreign uh, uh, company owners. So when we talk of the white community, that's precisely what we mean. So it is, in a sense, a white conspiracy. The white farmers and some of the white producers or businessmen will be very happy that we are in a fix. On the Sunday after the riots in the beer halls of the black suburbs, we found the government's attempt to blame the whites got short shrift. It was not an opposition party, it was not the, uh, the white people who caused that, whoever is known. It's just... It's only we people who thought of that. We wanted to show the government that we dislike that, what they did. 
we can't say it's a word, man, because, yeah, things can go up. And just like you have your own company, and then, yeah, the government says, okay, we raise the taxes. How much you pay for the company? For you to get uh, that money, it means you have to raise your things as well. So we cannot say, we blame the government for that. City people realize that without the approval and investment of the rich white world, they're doomed to a life of joblessness and poverty. But out in the rural areas where ZANU still has a powerful hold, it's land that's always been the linchpin. They've been patient here a long time, but times are hard and a desperate government is looking for a scapegoat. Look at that. No, that looks great, Tony. Yeah. Super. Well done. Right. Anne and James Sinclair are not racists. Mr. Mugabe says you should all go home. Um, You've got anywhere to, to go. go. <laughs> Home. Yeah. It's the only home I've ever known. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't know any other. I've got a Zimbabwean passport. There's only passport I can get. And that's we're, we're... it. It may not be good economics to hand flourishing farmland back to the peasants. But even in one party states, it's sometimes politics that comes first. Mm. 